will hear a number of different recordings, and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions, and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four sections. At the end of the test, you will be given ten minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. Now turn to section one. You will hear two women talking about house cleaning. First, you have some time to look at questions one to three. Listen carefully to the first part of the conversation and answer questions one to three. Well, Jill, I'm glad you had a nice holiday. We'll have to try it ourselves sometime. Yes, Kate, you really should. I'll give you a contact number for the hotel we stayed in. Anyway, I must be. Oh, I know what I meant to ask you. Sorry, it was about a cleaner. Oh yes, yes. We've been talking about getting somebody to come in and help out. You had a cleaner not long ago, didn't you? I thought you said having a cleaner was a waste of money. That you'd never pay somebody to do what you can do perfectly well yourself. Well, yes, <laughs> maybe. I... But things have changed. Things are really hectic for Greg at work all of a sudden. He's never home till after eight. I end up doing everything. The house looks like such a mess. I never get time to tidy up before I go out to work, and in the evenings I just about manage to cook and wash up. Well, you shouldn't be the one doing everything if you're working as well. That's not fair, is it? I think Greg's just shattered. <sighs> To be fair, he's pretty domesticated. We've always pretty much shared the chores. It's just a temporary thing, I think. <laughs> I hope. We're basically both trying to juggle too much. The last thing we want to do at the weekends is start cleaning. We want to relax a bit. It's not because all the neighbours have got a cleaner, is it? Hmm. <laughs> you know me too well. I guess there is a bit of that. I feel like the poor relation when I tell them I do all the cleaning myself. They can't believe I fit in so much. Never worry about what other people think. No. Anyway, one way or another, we need a cleaner. Well, as long as it's not too expensive, that is. I don't think it's expensive, and it's money well spent. We only stopped having Trisha come in every week because I was off work with the baby, so I could do most of it myself. So how much is it? Well, Trisha was eight pounds an hour. I can't say that's what everyone charges. That isn't bad, is it? It's less than I thought. Oh well, I think we can run to eight pounds. How many hours did she do? Four hours a week. Well, that sounds about right. Can you give me her number then? Oh, sorry, no. She's not around any more. She went back to Wales. I think it was Wales anyway, a couple of months ago. Oh no, that's a shame. Wait a minute, though. We've had some leaflets through the door recently. Let me see if I can find one. I put one here by the phone. I'm sure. You now have some time to look at questions four to ten.
Now listen to the rest of the conversation and answer questions 4 to 10. Ah, yes, here we are. It's a company. They're called dusters. Dusters? Yes, as in people who dust. You have to phone Abby on... Is that Abby with E-Y? No, it's A-double-B-Y. OK. And it's a local number, 650-918. 650 OK, got it. They do ironing and can look after your garden too, apparently. Mmm, ironing would be helpful. I loathe ironing. So, do they say how much it is? Yes, it's 9 50 an hour. That's for all the different services. 9 50? A bit more expensive then. They do a spring clean for £45. So, that's one big clean. Do they say how many hours that is? No, it just says spring clean. I guess it's five hours, so it's a bit cheaper than five hours of cleaning would be normally. Yes, probably. That might be a good idea to start off with. You'll like this too, Kate. They can use organic products if you want them to. Oh, yes, I'd prefer that. I don't like using strong chemicals. They're so bad for the environment. OK, I'll give them a call. Thanks for that. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 2 First you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen and answer questions 11 to 15. Hello everyone and welcome aboard the Sunshine Express on our journey from London to Naples. I'm Jane Sharp, the train manager, and I hope you'll all enjoy the trip. Before we depart, I'd like to tell you a bit about the train and its facilities. Now we're here on the observation deck which is where you'll probably spend most of your trip, as it offers the best views. And directly below us is, uh, well, we call it our leisure centre. There are some games machines, a television, a small library, and so on. If you've brought a laptop or computer with you, you can also get onto the internet here, as it has full Wi-Fi capability. There's also a small bar where you can get tea, coffee and light meals. For lunch and dinner, you'll use the restaurant car, which is at the front of the train. You'll have breakfast in your cabins, by the way, which will be brought to you by your steward. The two cars behind the restaurant are where you'll find the second-class cabins. Each cabin has seats which are changed into beds at night. You'll also find a simple basin for washing and a small fold-down table. First-class passengers, your cabins are at the back of the train. To get to them, you'll need to pass through the lounge, 
This can be used by everyone during the day, but is exclusive to first-class passengers after 6 p.m. Right at the back of the train, basically as far as you can go, is my office. If anyone needs to see me, though, please use the phone in your cabin rather than coming to the office. Just press one and you'll get me. If I'm not there, tell your steward you need to see the manager and he or she will look for me. Before the talk continues, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Right, let me give you a bit more information about the trip. The first part of our journey is from London to Paris, going through the Channel Tunnel. It will take us just over an hour to get to the tunnel, including a short stop before we get there to pick up some more passengers. From there, it'll be another three hours to Paris, so we're looking at four hours altogether, give or take a few minutes. A quick bit of advice about passports. You won't need these until we get to the Italian border, so I suggest you keep them in the safe, which you'll find in your cabin. Ask your steward, that's the person in charge of your carriage, for a key. That way, you won't need to carry them with you all the time. Now, meals. As I said earlier, breakfast tomorrow morning will be in your cabins and this will be served at about 7.30, 7.45. So you'll be able to enjoy it as we travel along the southern French coast. Lunch is at one o'clock in the restaurant car and dinner is at eight o'clock. Although we'd like you all to be at your table about 15 minutes earlier, at a quarter to, if you could. When we get to the Italian border tomorrow morning, our train will change engines and we'll also be getting in a new crew. We'll be taking advantage of the stop to have a look around. I've arranged a visit to the local market, a museum and a castle. This will take about four hours, with a break for coffee in a local cafe, and we'll be back on the train in time for lunch. A few quick rules. Some of you might have brought your own food or drink on board. That's fine, but could we ask that you consume it in your cabins and not in the restaurant or lounge? Could we also ask you to make sure your cabin windows are closed when you're not in your cabin? And whatever you do, don't get off the train until we reach the Italian border. Apart from the border and one or two other places which I'll tell you about, any stops we make will only be for a few minutes. I'd hate to leave anyone behind. All right, so moving on from the Italian border, we'll be heading right into the... That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 3. 
Section 3. You will hear two students discussing a project they have to do as part of a literature course on great books. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Hi, Joey. How are you doing? I heard you were sick. Oh, hi, Olivia. Yeah, I had a virus last week, and I missed a whole pile of lectures, like the first one on the great books in literature, where Dr. Castle gave us all the information about the semester project. I can give you copies of the handouts. I've got them right here. That's okay. I already collected the handouts, but I'm not very clear about all the details. I know we each have to choose an individual author. I think I'm going to do Carlos Castaneda. I'm really interested in South American literature. Have you checked he's on the list that Dr. Castle gave us? We can't just choose anyone. Yeah, I checked. It's okay. Who did you choose? Well, I was thinking of choosing Ernest Hemingway, but then I thought... No, I'll do a British author, not an American one. So I chose Emily Bronte. Okay. And first of all, it says we have to read a biography of our author. I guess it's okay if we just look up information about him on the Internet? No, it's got to be a full-length book. I think the minimum length's 250 pages. There's a list of biographies. Didn't you get that? Oh, right. I didn't realize we had to stick with that. So... What do we have to do when we've read the biography? Well, then we have to choose one work by the writer. Again, it's got to be something quite long. We can't just read a short story. But I guess a collection of short stories would be okay? Yes, or even a collection of poems, they said. But I think most people are doing novels. I'm going to do Wuthering Heights. I've read it before, but I really want to read it again now I've found out more about the writer. And then the video... We have to make a short video about our author and about the book. How long has it got to be? A minute. What? Like 60 seconds? And we got to give all the important information about their life and the book we choose? <laughs> well, you can't do everything. I wrote it down somewhere. Yes, Dr. Castle said we had to find or write a short passage that helps to explain the author's passion for writing, why they're a writer. So, we can back this up with reference to important events in the writer's life, if they're relevant. But it's up to us, really. The video's meant to portray the essence of the writer's life and the piece of writing we choose. So, when we read the biography, we have to think about what kind of person our writer is. Yes, and the historical context and so on. So, for my writer, Emily Bronte... The biography gave a really strong impression of the place where she lived and the countryside around. Right. I'm beginning to get the idea. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. Uh, can I check the other requirements with you? Sure. The handout said after we'd read the biography, we had to read the work we'd chosen by our author and choose a passage that's typical in some way, that typifies the author's interests and style. 
Yes, but at the same time, it has to relate to the biographical extract you choose. There's got to be some sort of theme linking them. Okay, I'm with you. And then you have to think about the video. So are we meant to dramatize the scene we choose? I guess we could, but there's not a lot of time for that. I think it's more how we can use things like sound effects to create the atmosphere, the feeling we want. And presumably visuals as well? Yeah, of course. I mean, I suppose that's the whole point of making a video. But whatever we use has to be historically in keeping with the author. We can use things like digital image processing to do it all. So we can use any computer software we want? Sure. And it's important that we use a range, not just one software program. That's actually one of the things we're assessed on. Okay. Oh, and something else that's apparently really important is to keep track of the materials we use and to acknowledge them. Including stuff we download off the internet, presumably? Yeah, so our video has to list all the material used with details of the source in a bibliography at the end. Okay, and you were talking about assessment of the project. Did they give us the criteria? I couldn't find anything on the handout. Sure, he gave us them in the lecture. Let's see, you get 25% just for getting all the components done. That's both sets of reading and the video. Then the second part is actually how successful we are at getting the essence of the work. They call that content, and that counts for 50%. Then the last 25% is on the video itself, the artistic and technical side. Great. Well, that sounds a lot of work, but a whole lot better than just handing in a paper. But thanks a lot, Olivia. You're welcome. That is the end of Section 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 4 Section 4 You will hear part of a lecture about a place called Kuba PD. First you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen and answer questions 31 to 40. Good afternoon. Today, we're continuing this series of talks on the development of the Australian outback with a look at Cuba PD, the desert town of opal mines and underground living, which lies 860 kilometres north of Adelaide and 690 south of Alice Springs. The inaccessibility harsh climate and almost total lack of water made it a highly unlikely place for human habitation. But that all started to change in 1915 with the discovery there of opals, the precious stones which seemed to change colour according to their surroundings. Settlements were established following the First World War when soldiers returning from the trenches of France brought with them the techniques of living below ground in dugouts. The depression of the 1920s and 30s led to many prospectors leaving, but the town boomed again in the late 1940s when shallow new opal fields were discovered and immigrants from Europe arrived in large numbers after the Second World War. It must be remembered, though, 
just how hostile conditions were. Daytime summer temperatures reached well over 50 degrees centigrade. Winter nights were bitterly cold, and dense dust storms regularly blanketed the town. To cope with this, more and more people began living in disused mines and purpose-built subterranean houses, where the temperature remains at a comfortable 25 degrees all year round, so that eventually around 70% of the town's inhabitants had made their homes beneath the surface. This led to the construction of hotels and even churches below ground, as well as an entire underground shopping centre, the only one in the world. Perhaps not surprisingly, this has now led to the emergence of a secondary industry, tourism. Increasing numbers of visitors come to see the tunnels and the caves with their ventilation shafts, the weird machines lying about in the town, and, just beyond it in the scorched red desert, the conical hills thrown up by the world's biggest opal mines. It's a logical stopping place for travellers, too. The nearest town to Cooperpedi is Woomera, in the prohibited area once used for launching space rockets, but even that is an enormous distance away. Within the town itself, there are plenty of hotel rooms and a number of ethnic restaurants. Remember that Cooperpedi is one of the most multicultural places in Australia, with an estimated 45 nationalities represented, and its very own Opal Museum. A short distance from town, there's a section of the enormous barrier that runs thousands of kilometres across the country. The dingo fence, which is meant to keep these predatory wild dogs out of the sheep farming areas. Another attraction just outside town are the sets of various films made there, including Mad Max 3, as well as The Red Planet and Until the End of the World. Names that reflect the harshness of the terrain and temperatures there. The name Kuba Pedi, incidentally, comes from an Aboriginal expression meaning white man's hole in the ground. Next, I'd like to go on to talk about Broken Hill, another mining town, but one that... That is the end of Section 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers. It's not a game, it's a red